closed. Oh, I'm sure you can do better. I saw it, but it's just for you to feel a little bit more comfortable with your body. Would you like to applaud again? Thank you. Perfect. Thank you for that introduction. My name is Mary Catherine Phillips and I'm working as a media innovation analyst at Twipe in Belgium. I'm very excited today to have this wonderful panel here to talk about audio with all of you. First, we'll be started with Shuban McHugh. Um, she is an award-winning podcast producer um, and a journalism educator. And so we can start with some slides from you to set the stage for further conversation. Thank you. It's great to be back at my fifth gen talking about podcasting, my passion. And that's just a slide with, uh, with me interviewing an Aboriginal artist from the Central Desert in Australia for a passion project of mine, a podcast called Heart of Artness. And later, plug, I'll be doing a workshop talking about those two podcasts, Wrong Skin and Phoebe's Fall, which were true crime investigative podcasts done with the Age Newsroom in Melbourne. So hoping to see some of you there. But before we get into talking about the diversity and cultural uh, difference aspects of podcasting, I think I just want to make the point that audio has its own common language. And we hear a lot about visual literacy, but we don't often think of audio literacy. And yet it is a medium and it has its own grammar, logic, aesthetics, and even rules. So. It's, it's worth thinking about this. Audio is not just the absence of pictures in video, which some people seem to mistakenly think it might be. It's exceptionally good at conveying emotion, mood, and personality, and you need to learn how to harness those things if you're going to make a good podcast. And you do that by crafting using characteristics like timing and texture and raw sound itself, which as many of you will know, is amazing for triggering the imagination. And they cross all boundaries of uh, culture and ethnicity. The other thing about podcasts, of course, are that they're good at bringing out the personal and at forging connections. So even the news narrative ones, like famously, of course, The Daily from the New York Times, harness this aspect of podcasting. And Again, a phrase that I like to use is that you can't freeze frame audio. It only exists in real time. And that's why timing is absolutely key to, to everything you're doing. And the other buzzword about podcasting in any language is authenticity. And as Groucho Mark once said, if you can fake sincerity, you've got it made. Well, you can't actually fake sincer sincerity on a podcast because people will be able to tell through your voice if you're being natural. So just you learn to be natural and that in itself creates a bond. Moving on to talk about aspects of diversity in podcasting, which we don't often consider in a kind of Anglo-centric world. I work with the Asia Pacific Broadcasting Union in a collaboration and they have an amazing range. They broadcast to literally over half the world, three billion people in 57 countries. Now, I'm a little bit chastened because I, I prepared this slide a few weeks ago and I was talking, congratulating uh, the ABC and the BBC and NPR on the robust public broadcaster that we all uh, enjoy, which is somewhat different in some of the countries in the ABU. So the ABC, the BBC has a mission to inform, educate and entertain, you know, as part of public interest journalism and other countries are subject to restrictions. But I'm sorry to have to say that uh, about two weeks ago, the ABC in Australia was raided by the Australian Federal Police who removed about 100 files relating to an investigation into alleged war crimes by the Australian Army. So uh, that, that was a very uh, disturbing development. However, coming back to the ABU, when I say content can be restricted in terms of what podcasts can be, sometimes it's because of poverty. I mean, you look at a country like East Timor or Kiribati, and they are severely limited in what they can do in terms of equipment. It might be a historical factor. So you have uh, in India a proud and wonderful tradition of over 100,000 newspapers, 
but we didn't have commercial radio and television networks until the 1990s. And also, of course, politics comes into it. You have certain state broadcasters where content is severely curtailed according to whatever particular regime is in power at the time. So India is particularly interesting at this point because it's a country of 1.3 billion people, and yet a recent report by Amit Doshi, who uh, has started his own indie, Indian podcast network called IVM, suggested that there are only about 200 podcasts in the country. And it's even more surprising because it's ready-made. You've got niche audiences, you've got an oral storytelling tradition, although that is linked more to a folkloric tradition than to, say, narrative or investigative journalism or conversational in interview formats. And Indians traditionally are, uh, love discourse and debate, and I think that this aspect is actually going to become much more important post the election of the BJP because there is a clear agenda to uh, uh, prioritize uh, the Hindu culture in India uh, with, with Modi. And I think that podcasting, for instance, could offer a potential for marginalized or um, voices that are being pushed to the corners to come through. And, and, and this is a perfect time for podcasting to flourish. The Quint is an, uh, a startup in India, an indie that some of you will know. It publishes stories and does fabulous fact-checking in English and Hindi. It does have two podcasts, but one is really just a straight read, four minutes. It's not, it's not really a polished audio, audio artifact. And the other is called The Big Story, and frankly, could be better. It could use crafting techniques. The India Explained is a funny uh, podcast I came across. Uh, two guys, two expats, one in London, one in San Francisco, proudly amateur. Uh, they say that they run off $25 of software. They do what we call chum casts, where two people, two pals, rip off a theme. Sometimes lightweight, pigeons in, pigeon problems in the city, the role of the moustache in Indian culture, sometimes more political. And certainly since the election, they've become overtly actually political, and they have said that they do not support the Modi regime and that it is there to, uh, to uh, preference and privilege the Hindu uh, male over, over all other... Um, Indians, so that's an interesting development already. Some strange ones culturally, the evolution of the Indian life insurance sector. I don't think that would be a hit on the iTunes charts in America, but it's one of the IVM stable. The Middle East is getting active as well. There's a, a very interesting podcast coming out of Jordan called Shame, and it explores essentially gendered issues, particularly issues for women around social, cultural, religious taboos, and apparently half its audience is next door in Saudi Arabia, for obvious reasons. Kern and Cultures is coming up with more of an American model. They want to be the next Gimlet. They're doing long-form documentary English and Arabic stories, aiming for a youth market. And then there's MST DFR podcasts in Jeddah, and they have a range of entertainment, current affairs shows. This guy does a gaming show. But whatever kind of podcast we're talking about, in whatever cultural setting, I do believe strongly, based on 30 plus years of working in audio, that the twin pillars of, of audio, which are common in, in radio as well, but further enhanced in podcasting because of the delivery mode, are intimacy and authenticity. And you can actually use cultural difference and local stories to, to attract people across cultural difference and gaps, because those kind of small stories can uh, strike a chord of empathy and be universal. What we need, though, are personable hosts, someone we like and trust, and personal stories, stories told from the heart, uh, and this is a great platform for minority stories to be heard. So I'm going to close with uh, a, a tiny clip from my own um, podcast that I worked on with the AIDS Wrong Skin, uh, because it's a reminder that even in a Western uh, country like uh, Australia, we often have overlooked minorities, our, our own Aboriginal people in this case. And this podcast was a very hard story to tell. It's about a clash between traditional culture, contemporary politics, and mining money 
when two people from a wrong skin, there are skin names that determine in, in remote traditional communities who can marry whom, and this young couple flouted the law, ran away, went missing, and it did not end well. So I'll just play you this clip, and um, I'm not sure how I do that. I think I just click. But it's had great success, which has been very heartening because it shows that there is a hunger to hear marginalized voices. So just here's, listen for the, the sound of both white and indigenous voices. Whoops, back. Someone has to click it. Can somebody click that? We found a um, bowerbird nest, and in that bowerbird nest were some knuckles, of human knuckles. Blood time is when people disappear. Come back, come back with Chilling Dandala. You're probably going to get killed. Come back. Then it'll come back. This is Wrong Skin, an investigation into an unsolved suspicious death and a missing person in the Australian outback. I'm Richard Baker, a journalist with the Melbourne Age in Australia. This isn't just another true crime podcast. This is a story about power, love and consequences in the oldest civilization on our planet. Thank you very much, Siobhan. I'd like to now introduce Mark Pagan, who is also an award-winning producer. Um, he's also an educator at PRX, and you'll now be explaining to us a bit about that. Hello. All right, I'll try this one. Um, it's really, there are a lot of lights in here, so this may be hard to see, but by, I want to ask the audience something by a show of hands. Who here is either making a podcast or works somewhere where the company is making a podcast? Raise them high. Okay, okay, so a fair amount of you. Uh, great, and, and Siobhan gave a, a great primer for those that have come into podcasting or are, are interested. Um, I'm very curious, and we don't have time to talk to the audience uh, necessarily about why you all are here, but you know, of course I'm, I'm available after this and happy to talk some more. Um, part of the reason that I'm here is uh, through PRX. I came through podcasting through a few different things. I started in film and television, uh, became an educator and a social worker, and I just want to give a little anecdote about why, and this kind of references, Siobhan, what you were saying on earlier about some of the intimacy with the medium. Um, coming from film and television, as many of you know, is a burdensome, wonderful, lovely monster of a medium, uh, especially the amount of personnel, money, and equipment that you need. And about seven years ago, I went to go do, I used to work in um, mostly documentary production. And I went to a shoot uh, to which I had all the equipment and nobody else showed up from my crew. And uh, the people that I was supposed to interview were husband and wife and the husband was already very suspicious about having to talk on camera about his marriage. So I did not show up in a very good capacity. And um, I just thought very quickly about what I could do, and I had recently bought a field kit. I didn't know what I was gonna do with it, but uh, everybody had told me to, bought, to buy a Zoom, as well as uh, use my shotgun mic and a pistol grip. They said, maybe you'll wanna have some access to doing more audio interviews. So luckily I had this with me. I wasn't a very good audio producer or recorder, but I just took this out. I put away all the lighting and camera equipment and talked to the husband. And within five minutes, he was telling me secrets. His wife leaned over to me and said, I didn't even know that. Now, I could say that that is my skills as an interviewer, which I think I have skills, but I do think it's the inherent nature of the medium. Uh, something that even within the audience gives you a lot, but as a person who is producing and working within the medium, it, uh, it moves towards authenticity. You cannot be inauthentic even when you are engaged with subjects and within uh, making the medium. So I think like little eye contact, complete connection with the subject really helped. Um, as far as PRX, we are a tech and media company. We're in the United States. Uh, I and the training team, which I will talk a bit about, uh, are in New York City. Uh, PRX proper is in Boston, and we merged last year with Public Radio International, um, and they are in uh, Minneapolis, so Boston, Minneapolis, and then Satellite in New York. Uh, we're a tech and media company. We uh, distribute shows for public radio, um, shows like This American Life, 
Uh, and then as well through our um, podcast network, uh, Radiotopia, we also distribute shows like uh, 99% Invisible. There's a number of wonderful things that PRX is doing, one of which is a training program which started uh, last year. And um, I don't know if, if continue with the slides or if we're, okay, okay great. Um, so uh, the one of the programs that we started last year was the Google Podcast Creator Program. Uh, Google came to us um, to create a program. It's a one-year program which we are training international podcasters and providing them with seed funding. I could say a lot more, but I brought a video. It's a quick video, and hopefully this can explain a bit more about the program. Uh, no. Or I can explain more. Let's see if the video comes up. There we go. Google approached PRX with this idea of encouraging content creation from around the globe. We really want there to be more voices, more people telling their stories and the stories of their communities. I think what I like the most about training is talking with the other teams from all around the world and hearing about what kind of stories that they're lifting up and, and giving a voice to. It's really inspiring. I feel like I'm just absorbing things like a sponge and it's a lot to take in, but I feel like by the end of it, it'll make more sense. This is a total team that is going to be running with you for the next six months and beyond. I've met people from all over the world who are working on podcasts that range from narrative podcasts to podcasts about the Filipino diaspora. I'm very excited to see how we progress as a group and as a cohort. The most exciting part of training for me has definitely been applying this design thinking model to podcasting. Design thinking is all about having a bias toward action, which means trying things out, doing them, and then getting feedback, talking to your users. It's a muscle I haven't really flexed in a while, and I feel like this program, I feel like, beat it into you, but in a good way. We are learning how to, how to think different, how to create, how to explore. It's been really interesting to break things down and I'm thinking we're about to build them up again. I feel like every day, like I'm understanding things better and I'm getting more creative and I'm looking at things in a totally different way. It's gonna be actually exciting to go back and to relook at the first episodes that we've created and see how we can implement some of these ideas that we've learned. The process of having the sky as your limit before committing to what direction you want to go is something that we're definitely going to put into practice. Boot camp has been super challenging, really, really highly stimulating. It's been a creative explosion. So I just want to give a few quick bullet points um, before moving on to Jade. Um, the program was launched in October 2018. And with the grant from Google, uh, we have two application windows. The first application window started in October and we closed in December. We had no idea uh, how many applications we'd get. This is a global accelerator program, so anyone from around the world uh, could submit an application regardless of what stage they were in production with their podcasts. And after two, two months of an application window, we received over 6,200 applications, had to pick six teams, uh, did not get a lot of sleep. And then a few months later, we launched our second application window, which we closed in April. So for a grand total of around 10,000, between the two application windows, 10,000 applications from around the world. And so there's a lot of evidence of, of what's happening globally, podcasting-wise, that we received from these applications. And we just picked our next six teams, which we're announcing on Wednesday, but I can kind of give some hints as to where they are in the world uh, as we talk but um, there's lots of exciting things to say about it. Thank you very much, Mark. And finally, to round out our panel, I'd like to introduce Jade Wan Lu. Um, she is the head of China Plus, which is the English radio division of China's um, state radio and TV broadcaster. And mm -hmm. maybe you can introduce a bit about your role and what you're interested in with audio. Okay, I used to run the English service of China Radio International, but that organization has since 15 months ago been merged into um, the state radio and television broadcaster of China, China Media Group. So right now I do not have an official capacity to introduce myself in, but um, I guess I can still come here and share uh, my observations of uh, the Chinese podcasting scene. 
because I'm a 100% radio person. Well, one of our radio shows, uh, Roundtable, have uh, quietly been enjoying, let's say, a monthly 200,000 downloads on Apple, iTunes, which surprised us, actually, without marketing, without a lot of um, additional effort spent on it, on it. It wasn't even a tailor-made podcast show. It was a radio program. And that's what um, the pretty much all the radio stations in China do. We only do two things online. We offer live streaming and we upload our you know, radio shows for people to download. So um, I have to make two things clear before sharing anything further. Uh, when it comes to introducing the Chinese podcasting scene, we need to understand that the uh, Chinese podcasting market is by no means spearheaded by us, the public radio stations. They are created by the vast majority of individual Chinese people who may come from different creative industries or they can be any average Chinese individual who's passionate about producing something in the audio form. So that's one thing to keep in mind. And another thing is that podcasting is such an under-recognized concept in my country that it even surprised me when I wanted to prepare for this sharing because I, I needed to go out and talk to people about podcasting. And I, I'm surprised because there are, according to a certain statistics, uh, there are 200 million iPhone users in China. But I had to explain to pretty much everybody I ran into what podcasting is. So I pondered over that and I think the reason is because podcasting, the word podcast, is only mentioned in Apple. And Apple has far less impact than its local competitors, who tend to not draw a line between podcasting and all the other forms of audio content that they now try to offer, um, including audiobooks, live streaming of pretty much everything in the audio form. So uh, um, what I'm sharing today may not strictly fall, uh, uh, fit your definition of podcasting, but I think that's what makes the Chinese market so very much more interesting. Um, and we, as the English content provider and um, a public radio station, we have started last year to produce podcasts around uh, the subject matters relating to traditional Chinese culture basically because we want to stay relevant to both our domestic listeners and our overseas listeners. Um, relevant to our uh, domestic listeners because wh whatever we produce would be um, properly produced English, you know, well-produced English content for the vast majority of English language learners in China. Um, and uh, we want to stay relevant to our overseas listeners because if they're interested in um, hearing something you know, fun to share, easy to understand, some insight into our, our 5,000 year culture, then maybe they can find some of the answers from what we offer. So, thank you, you very much, Jay. It's very interesting, and I'm looking forward to digging into these topics further in our discussion. We've been asked to explore quite a few topics concerning podcasts, and so I've prepared um, a few slides with questions and quotes to trigger some kind of conversation, perhaps even a debate amongst us. Uh, I would like us all to look at this quote um, and look at this idea of a bubble. Are we reaching a, a bubble for podcasts? Is it a boom? How do you guys view the, the coming years? Yeah. Um, I don't, I, I think there's somebody that can probably speak about this a little bit more elegantly than I can, but I, I love quotes like this because I, I immediately react and go, it's, uh, there's no bubble. There's no bu there, there potentially is uh, bubble media-wise that, that can happen at some point, but we are at still such a burgeoning stage of what's happening with the medium. Um, I, I just think things are happening in terms of like smart speakers being used. Like even technology-wise, there is such like beginning breadcrumbs and, and how it can broaden as well. And this is, you know, a big part of the reason that I'm here is that um, there's still a lot of U.S. dominance within podcasting. And we have not heard 
you know, the, the, at least on the U.S. side, there is, you know, we are paying attention to where the, the global aspects are popping up. They, until that happens, until there's like, until we are referencing more in an anecdotal way, um, the international hotspots or at least the international ten trends and tendencies that are happening, like we're at such an early stage of, of anything, um, in, anything being close to a bubble, even though more money is coming into the medium. And I'm saying the U.S. dominance not in a way of, of of pride or anything like that. I just think that it's it's often globally what we're hearing are referenced um, uh, even within things like this application window and with other producers. There's still a lot of U.S. productions that are being referenced. And if you look at the top trends or the even statistically in the analytics of consumption globally, you know, it's still mostly a a North American white male dominated um, uh, field or, or listening. Which is, but what's interesting there, I think, Mark, is that just in March, VoxNest published some statistics that showed that the geographical area that had grown most in that month was Chile, followed by Argentina, Peru, Mexico, and then China. So extraordinary, 84% growth in Chile and then about half that in the other countries. And that is apparently quite linked to Spotify moving into the space. And again, more of an Android kind of um, market there. So uh, that's really interesting. And that leads us to our absent friend, Carolina Guerrero, who couldn't be here for family reasons, and Radio Ambulante, which is of course, she's the CEO of, co-founder with Daniel Alarcón, and Radio Ambulante is this amazingly successful uh, uh, po podcast that openly acknowledges that they basically model themselves on This American Life, which, of course, is the godfather of U.S. podcasting along with Radiolab. We know that back, uh, you know, in, in 20 years ago. But Radio Ambulante, I, I had a look at some of the stats, and what they, they've got 640 million potential listeners in Latin America, so nobody's going to ignore that, not to mention Hispanics in the US and, of course, Spain. And what interests them, though, the statistic that they have, 25% of their listeners have no Latino or Spanish background. So that's, again, a transcultural interest. People are listening, either some people are trying to, like my son is listening because he's trying to learn Spanish at, at uni and it's a great way to do it. You hear really interesting stuff and they provide an English transcript. Other people are just genuinely interested in the region and trying to understand the stories. So that's one area where certainly not a bubble. And again in China, just to pick up on what you were saying, Jade, I read a fascinating PhD. It's not often I, I come across a PhD and find myself reading it from cover to cover. Like, it was actually that good. And it was called Radio and Trans Social Transformation in China, published by a young scholar. And she had analyzed what you were talking about, those other platforms, Jimalaya FM, which is like an audio YouTube in China, and people can upload their own content. So it's not what we would consider our beautifully crafted podcasts or our interview format or our chumcasts or our gabfests but it's still nonetheless audio content that's finding a market. And the other ones that I came across were Dragonfly FM, Leechy FM, uh, listening apps that go out on WhatsApp and have enormous audiences by Western standards. One of them had 10 million subscribers in 18 months, a thing called night listening, which sounded like a kind of, uh, you know, a very soppy saccharine type thing where some, this guy reads a little heartwarming thing on a theme of, of love or something and intersperses it with a love song. But, you know, hey, he's, he's getting seven million clicks per episode. And I think that brings us to the other form of interesting audio content in China, which has come uh, to light of late, which is knowledge content, paying for knowledge. So people, it's a seven billion dollar industry to pay for knowledge. And Jade, you said to me when we were sitting watching the Reuters Institute report yesterday, oh, that's interesting, look, they want to, they listen to podcasts to gain knowledge as well, because that, that was a thing. 54% of people said I listen to, you know. But I think it's different. So I think if I listen to Dan Carlin, Hardcore History, six hours on the battle of something in the First World War or the Roman Empire, that's so that I can drop a little nugget into the conversation at a dinner party or something. But in China, from, from what I understand, because of the social changes, and the huge difference in the last, say, um, particularly 10 years, 
there's a, there's a movement that academics call the privatization of the self. So things like healthcare, education, they used to be state funded things, but now people are having to look after themselves and it feels more competitive and people are feeling that they need to groom themselves in response. Is that fair to say? And housing too, yes. Yeah, yeah, we as a country has been moving really fast in the, fast fo in the past 40 years. And you, you just now you mentioned a couple of the aggregators, uh, really powerful uh, competitors for, for Apple. I guess I mentioned earlier that Apple was no con is in no position to compete with its local players. Uh, I'll just tell you one figure. Apple has one person to manage podcasting products in China. In fact, that person has to take care of a number of neighboring countries as well. And you mentioned Himalaya, which is the audio uh, YouTube, right? Because of their UGC kind of a model, they encourage everybody <laughs> to start producing audio content. I'll share with you some of the numbers. Um, they, right now they have 73% of the market share. Um, they have 2,000 staff members. 530 million active users who on average listen to um, audio contents on their platform for 147 minutes per day per person. Mm. And um, they have 7 million hosts, just to give you an idea how many people are contributing. Yes, 7 million hosts. So hosts mean just an ordinary citizen person just presenting, just presenting those audio. Yeah, an indie yeah. person. Yes, yes, um, including professional ones, of course. And their products fall into 20 different categories, 328 subgenres. That huge. So I'm not drawing conclusions here. I'm not saying either it's a bubble or it's a boom. I'll let you come to your own conclusion. And there are words saying that Himalaya FM, we're, we're talking about Himalaya FM, the leading player. There are words saying that it has the potential to become the fourth largest internet giant in China after the BAT, I mean, Baidu, the search engine, Alibaba, the online shopping giant, and Tencent. So if we were to guess who had the uh, biggest chance of winning the distribution battle, it would probably, I'm pinning hopes, I'm betting on Himalaya. Yeah, and you mentioned this uh, phenomenon of knowledge product. We have started to call it knowledge e-commerce, which took off in the year 2016, when China's version of Quora, I think it's called Quora, right? The, the Q&A online communication, uh, uh, the community, China's Quora decided to launch a paid subscription service. Of course, it was in written form, but the other aggregators picked up on that and started to offer their knowledge sharing podcasts for a certain amount of subscription fee. And Himalaya FM, um, launched this marketing stunt. Uh, I'm not sure whether you're familiar with the uh, November 11 shopping uh, spree uh, festival launched by Alibaba. Mm -hmm. Okay, I skipped that part. Anyway, uh, Himalaya launched this festival, self-introduced festival on December 3rd, selling knowledge sharing podcasts on that particular day, starting in 2016. And that day in year one, generated something like 7 billion US dollars, and that sales fall in quadrupled in the following year, further doubled last year. So it's just scary. And you mentioned why. Um, well, I just think, I think it's interesting that it's linked to this, this thirst for education because of the need to get ahead now that certain services that once were... There's this growing anxiety and competition among the workforce, trying to stay competitive, um, which leads to the new belief of a lifetime learning philosophy. I think that's been bought by many ambitious Chinese young people. Plus, let's not forget, there's um, increasingly affordable 4G coverage and mobile payment, all of these make it really easy, effortless to pay for online content. And there's this um, widely uh, spread um, acceptance of the idea that we should be paying for online, for good quality online content. So all of those factors combined, I think, have contributed to this takeoff of the knowledge e-commerce right now. So I'm having difficulty drawing a line between like traditional podcasting and all of these knowledge sharing 
whatever you call it, MOOCs or lectures or even speeches in various different fields, like philosophy, uh, psychology, education, Medicare, art, history, you name it. We have those products in each and every of those categories. No, that's very interesting. I think it's a question we'll have to continue a discussion on. Um, I want to make sure we have time to get to a few more of these discussion points. One thing that I've heard already in a few of the sessions from audience members is this question of how can you monetize audio beyond advertisements? Um, of course, we, we see advertisements working well, um, particularly host-read um, advertisements. And yesterday, Nick Newman was also explaining that we can't forget this loyalty aspect that with podcasts, you have such a longer engagement time. Um, it's a very personal experience, often directly in your ear. And so what do you guys think about monetization? Let's talk about that yeah. yeah, well, there's there's a lot to look at, and, and there's a lot that I think we can all pay attention to, to, to podcasts that are happen, happening around the world. And going back to Radio Volante, they, they are incredible. Um, it's too bad Carolina can't be here because, of course, she can speak so wonderfully about everything that they've done. And I prompt everybody to, to both follow them as well as listen, um, regardless if you speak Spanish or not. Um, they've been doing, again, their, their platform and their podcasts, and I don't know the genesis in terms of whether they were specifically aiming for s certain regions within Latin America. Um, anecdotally, um, uh, Daniel Alarcón is uh, Peruvian, and then Carolina, I think, is Colombian, I believe. Um, but regardless, uh, Spanish-speaking audiences. And so one of the things that they, they found is, again, that there, there are these pockets that are happening all around the world. But they have done something that I, I think is ingenious um, in terms of what I've paid attention to, is that they're really focusing, and I think this is globally, no matter where you are, you really have to focus on the community aspect of what's happening for your content or for your show. And so they realize that there may not be people that want to come to the podcast actually as a listener. So part of what they've done have been listservs and um, maybe things with Facebook groups and ways, and, and there are indirect ways to monetize from there. But what that's doing is building a larger cohort within these communities. And then from there, the other thing that's really fascinating is that they are building listening parties. Uh, these listening parties, and um, yeah, we will have to ask Carolina some of the details about it, um, but I, I don't know the organization element around that, if that's something that as well is monetized. But what they're doing is building a bigger audience and also bigger by building a, a bigger investment from those people. And I think that's, there's a number of ways we can go down the road talking about uh, sustainability and talking about sponsorship, which of course is a model, I think, globally that everybody is paying attention to. But the numbers for that are are pretty large. You know, for, let's say in the United States, most podcasts have to reach X amount of downloads. 35,000 yeah, days. There, there we go, the, the actual number. So 35,000 or above to meet sponsorship with most advertisers. Now that, that's not to say that if, you're, if you are making content for a thousand listeners that you don't have options. Um, your options, and again, maybe that is the goal is a thousand listeners because you are doing a rural, I'm, I'm just making one example, a rural based podcast that's reaching within this community or this region and there might be local sponsors that would be able to be interested in paying or there are events and things like that. But going to the community aspect, I think that is one of the big things to pay attention to with, I mean, community just really is the underlying point or the underlying area of um, podcasting. It's a way to build sustainability and funding. And there are a number of ways, whether they're offshoot ways or whether it's actual events or whether it's this ambulante model where you're, you're building listening parties where you're introducing communities that may actually not be sourcing your content but at the very least, they're coming and engaging with other people around it. And just quickly to add to that, a lot of organizations are using the podcast trust factor that is gained through the intimacy that we've talked about in order to um, cross-promote other products that they make. So, for instance, the Age newspaper would cross-promote other things. I heard The Daily doing the same for The New York Times. So the fact that we all love Michael Barbaro, that spins off for the New York Times in many ways, indirectly as well. And it's only quite recently that they've started placing paid ads 
in the podcast. Sponsorship we had as well with General Electric, GE, a US company, coming into Australia and using it to actually uh, get a foot in a different market. And the other way that audio can be monetized beyond advertisements, the podcast we did called Phoebe's Fall was about a 24-year-old woman and it attracted a whole new young female demographic to what was an old style paper. So that is again um, monetizable in an indirect way. No, this is very interesting, um, and I want to make sure we have time for some questions and answers. So if we can have some microphones, that would be great. And in the meantime, I just want to let you all know that after this, we'll be also meeting um, upstairs for the coffee break, where we can continue this discussion, and we're inviting any audio enthusiasts to join us. Do we have any questions? I, can we give them a mic? Yeah, thank you. Hi, I'm uh, Thomas uh, Lauren from being in Farab in the Netherlands. Uh, I ran a, a company for 10 years that produced video and political cartoons, and the reason why the political cartoon company still exists is because it's so much cheaper to produce. I was wondering if you could give me an idea of what it costs to produce a podcast, because I think that could be one of the reasons why it is a viable model to pursue. I'm not laughing because of anything you said. I love this question, and it's like, it is the, the mystery around all of us. I'll give numbers, at least in the US, but there's, there's a number of, of categories in which we could, we could strip away. Um, roughly uh, $1,000 to $10,000 an episode for a podcast. Now this number, we could sit here for an hour and talk about some of these parameters. Um, there's a big difference, though, between, again, it's really who you're trying to reach, um, if you are trying to reach, let's say, local, um, I just did a, a I do con some consulting work and I just met with a company last week that really just wants to reach out to other companies. They want to reach out to a, like a few dozen CEOs. Um, so their, their production model is probably about seven episodes and it's going to be, you know, what we might label a chat cast where they're talking with other company owners. The, the level of investment in something like that is pretty small. So again, that may not be that, what I'm saying may be a bit moot, but it really depends on personnel and the, the equipment. This is seven or eight years old. This doesn't cost anything. It's, it's personnel. I mean, the amount of the thing that I was shocked by when I moved into podcasting, even if this is an interview show, is that podcasting is writing. Um, and the amount of time that it takes even just for copy and the editorial side of things. So um, output, uh, how big an audience and what, what the reach is with audience, uh, the time and investment it takes to uh, uh, reach that audience and how, what is that funneling down to what kind of show you're trying to make. So again, if it's a weekly or bi-weekly show, that is something that's more um, reported, more narrative driven, that is a monster. That's, that's just, that takes a, a lot of time, work and personnel. Versus it's a um, two person hosted show talking about you know, um, uh, your work uh, uh, with uh, political illustrations and cartooning and things like that. That may be, that's a different production animal in which something, quote unquote, you may, able to, may, be, may be able to show up and do, and the heavier lift will be on the post-production side. So it's, again, there's, it, it really comes down, when it finally funnels down, it's the kind of show that you're making, and that'll, uh, that'll dictate how much you're spending to make it. The main thing is just making it sound good, so regardless of what you have available, um, just not making it sound bad, as simple as that sounds. Do we have another question? Yes, um, over there. Hello, my name is Mircha from Audio Brief News. I'm curious about synthetic voice. I mean, now it, the quality increased quite a lot and uh, I think in a couple of years will be quite good. How will this influence the podcasting? Uh, will people start using that instead of using uh, expensive equipment in order to record and uh, will they adopt this? What's your opinion on that? Well, I'm, uh, you're talking about smart speakers, uh, are we? The or voice used also in the smart speakers. As right. Well, sorry, that's heresy to me. I don't want my podcast to be um, based around, uh, you know, a Siri or, or something like that. The whole core of the podcasting that I care about is the human voice of real people 
telling stories from the heart. And if that goes, for me, it's nothing. I mean, there are, there, there, there are plenty of podcasts out there on tech and other kind of things and business, but they don't actually interest me. I mean, I'm a journalist uh, who is interested in the, the social um, experience of a, a diverse range of people. So, uh, to, to, you know, you're squandering the whole notion of intimacy if you're just moving straight to entertainment content, as far as I'm concerned. I mean, I may be a bit extreme here, but um, I just think that, you know, this is happening as well in China. We find that we've got this storytelling podcast called Gushi, which is modeled on This American Life, which is ordinary stories that have been absent from the media landscape. Um, a, a, a gay woman marrying, a, a, a lesbian marrying a gay man as a, as a marriage of convenience just to allow her to feel she can live in the society. These are the kind of stories we want to hear, real people's lives. So I don't think that, um, maybe I'm misunderstanding the question, but I think that the old fashioned way of interviewing people and producing it as well as you can to leverage the qualities and strengths that audio has will always be the gold standard. Thank you very much. Um, we've run out of time, but I look forward to continuing this conversation upstairs. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Uh,